it's, it's been a while. <laughs> All right, folks, we'll, uh, we'll open up with questions for Coach Ciano. Fr uh, second row left, Ari. Uh, Ari Walsh with the uh, athletic reg. Um, last year, you were in a position, you almost became a head coach. I was just wondering, from your standpoint, when they're making a decision to have an interim head coach, you seemed like a logical decision just from the outside. What was your take on the decision making? And, um, you know, did you feel as if this was an opportunity for you to step in here? Well, whenever you have a situation like this, it's very complex. Um, but when you have leaders like Gene Smith and President Drake, they understand this institution better than anyone. They understand what's needed at the time. So um, what we have done as a staff, I think, is what's special. You know, Ryan is certainly qualified to do this. Um, Kevin Wilson, myself, and the rest of the staff, guys like Larry Johnson, have done this a long time. Um, we all said we have to step it up. You know, we're missing, we're missing our leader. We're, we're one down right now. And, I think the staff has done that, and I think in turn the players have followed our lead. We have some great leadership, and uh, all that combined, I think, is, is what's going to allow us to be successful. So um, I'm looking forward to going out and, and coaching football again in a game. It's been a while. Um, this has certainly been something that, as, as much as we've worked to stay focused, um, when it's people you care about, it's, it's hard. Greg, when, we, when the stuff is happening at Tennessee, we asked you, um, about that, you said there would be a time to talk about it. I was wondering, is this the time where you're willing to discuss that and how it went, how it impacted you, and do you feel as if that um, situation down at Tennessee has impacted your future in any way? Well, certainly things like that are, you know, those are tough to, to stomach, but uh, now isn't the time to talk about it. Um, there will be, there'll be a time, but now is not the time. Young man in the blue, fourth row left. Uh, and Andy Anders, like I go. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. How uh, how is the scheme change with Coach Branch in the second year? Um. Well, first off, we're we're really blessed to have him here. He's a tremendous coach. He's a guy that uh, brings great energy to our staff, and um, he's a man that's led a defense, a very successful defense. So he's a great addition. Um, he <clears throat> excuse me. He certainly brought some uh, some fine ideas. You know, when you, when you put a defensive package together, there's a couple things you have to take into account. You have your philosophy as a program, so it has to fit into the philosophy of the program. Then you have to look at your personnel and say, now how can we, with the personnel we have, carry out the, the vision of the head football coach? And as one side of the ball, that's our job. And Alex has been a huge part of every year you recreate it because your, your personnel changes. Uh, front row right, Bill? Uh, Greg, could you kind of go through some of the position battles on defense? Who's going to line up at linebacker? Or who's going to be the safety opposite Jordan Fuller? Uh, gladly. One of the things about our linebacker group, because you mentioned that first, uh, we feel really fortunate that we have great depth. Now, what's happened in the competition in the spring and then in, in the training camp, uh, the guys that will start the game are going to be Pete Werner, Baron Browning, and Malik uh, Harrison. From there, I think more people will play. Now, generally, we have not done that, right? We've we've rotated the defensive line. We haven't done that at the, at the linebacker position. I'm not sure we're going to do that full scale like we do with the D-line every game, um, but we're going to see more people play. I think um, two guys that are coming off surgeries, right? Tough Borland and uh, Dante Booker, those guys, as they get to be more and more game ready, they're going to need some reps. So uh, it's an interesting... Um, situation at that position, but one we're excited about. It's not one, you know, sometimes they say, well, if you don't have your starters, then you don't have starters. I don't agree. I think we have more than three starting quality linebackers, so we're going to play the guys that, uh, that we think. The other thing you do is packages. So you try to utilize the talents of your guys. Um, so we have different packages and different situational football that will allow certain guys to get on the field. For Warner, um, what enabled him to become a starter? Well, I tell you, he's made a, a quite an ascension, right? You saw him kind of grow <coughs> up on the special teams last year, and that's you know the history and tradition of this program. That's how it's been. Guys have made their name on special teams and then continued that ascension, and he did just that. He had a great spring. Um, he really, really worked hard to change his body to, to mature his body, and he's he's a much bigger man now than he was as a freshman, and. Uh, I think with every rep he gains valuable experience, he's getting better and better and better. So, you know, his arrow was certainly pointed up. Front row right, Austin. Hey, Greg, 
Greg Austin Ward from Laird Monroe. Um, also, just to stick with those linebackers, when do you all expect Tough 412 to be back? We saw him participate just in those two open practices. It, it seemed like he might miss the whole season, but when do you think he might be back now? He may be back this week. You know, I, it's amazing the way he has rehabbed the job that our people in the um, training room, our medical people have handled him, the way Coach Mick has handled him. And more important than any of that is the way that Tough is such a committed young man to what he's doing. And uh, he's made incredible progress. As a coach and as a father, I kind of am hesitant because that's a serious injury, as you know. But uh, you, know, you have to have to trust the medical people and if they say he can go. So we'll see. You know, By the end of the week, we'll figure out what he can and can't do or what he should or shouldn't do. Uh, but he's ahead of schedule, well ahead of schedule. Dating back to the spring, you guys said the other safety spot was the biggest concern, maybe on the whole team. Uh, is that still the case for you? Are you uncertain going into week one? As, as Isaiah claimed that job, where do you sit there opposite Jordan Fuller? Well, I think it's been a great competition, which has raised both Isaiah and Jocelyn's game. Um, they're both going to play. And if you remember last year when we started the season with Jordan and, and Eric, right, they both played and then Jordan pulled away and became the starter and uh, became a really fine starter, as we know. Um, so I don't know if that'll happen or if all season long those two guys will go back and forth. Um, but whatever happens, I've said this to you guys before, you can't make it happen. you got to let it happen. Now you encourage and you coach and you teach, but at the end of the day, they have to go out there and play their way into a position. Far left, Matt. Uh, Matt McCoy, 457 as well. Um, there have been so much stuff going on around the program. I'm just wondering, from your perspective, the guys during training camp, was, were they able to block out the outside stuff? What, what is your take of the kind of camp you had, given the unusual circumstances? I thought we had an outstanding camp. I really do, and it's a, it's a, uh, a testament to those players, our leadership first, and, and, the, and the whole squad. Um, having said that, certainly to block it out would be, you know, that would be uh, not true. I mean, the guys have done their best to stay focused on the task at hand. And, you know, one of the things we talk about all the time around here is, you know, keep the main thing the main thing. You know, stick to what we're here to do. And you can't do anything about some of those other things that are happening outside right now. But what you can do is, is really grow as a team and grow as a player. College football is a little different, right? Training camp is the only time that we have their undivided attention. It's the only time all year long. They have academics. They have different social things going on. So training camp, they're ours. And it's critical. That's where your team is forged. That's where your personality, your team comes, your leadership. So it's, it's not like you can do a do-over. You know, it happens once. You have those three weeks, and it has to happen. And I thought Ryan Day did an incredible job stepping into that role. Unbelievable. I think our coaching staff did, and most importantly, as I said, our players. Uh, uh, front row, second row right, Rob. Uh, Greg Rob out of Columbus Dispatch. So the events of the last, whatever, four or six weeks have sort of brought to light this idea of what are the responsibilities of a college coach? You've lived it. You, Rutgers, you were the head guy, and yet you were also in the NFL. Can you sort of share the nuances and really what the differences are there from a, we have to figure out over the entire program versus just football? Well, as a college head football coach, you are. You're responsible for a lot of things, a lot of people, um, and that's what you sign up for. Um, that's part of the job that I really enjoy, is that you touch so many different people and you're able to help so many different people grow. But there's a great responsibility that comes with that. Um, in the National Football League, it's a little different in that there's a general manager that has control of, and responsibility for some things. You as the head coach have responsibility for some other things. Uh, and then just the fact that you know, you're dealing with grown men, uh, some you know in their 20s, some into their 30s. When I first started coaching the NFL, when I, at my first stint, I was uh, 29 years old. And I was coaching people that were older than I, so it is. Uh, it's it's definitely different. The relationships you bond in college with the players is different because they're developing as young men, and uh, it's incredible to see. When you, when you recruit a guy as a 15 or 16 year old, and then you see him graduate as a 21, 22 year old, uh, it's, it's like your own kids. I'm going through that now with my own children. That, that's the age group that mine are. And you just see it by the day, how they change and how they mature. And uh, that's the thing that brought me back to college football, quite frankly. 
and uh, the part I love most about it. As a follow, real quick, which job is more stressful ultimately? You know what I say is it, in college football, it's a lifestyle. So if your your family has, you know, the NFL is. This is the way I put it to people. Six months of the year, you work a normal job. So you go in, you know, 7.38, and you get home for dinner. College football, that's not the case. College football, your family better be part of it because there's not enough time to do both. There's recruiting, spring football, recruiting weekends. So, uh, you know, I heard Ryan say something about his, having his son around here. That's what I always tried to do because I know you can't have two – Two things going. You have to make it one. Otherwise, it's hard to do justice to either. Second row left, Lori. Coach Urban always kind of downplayed his role in the defense. So, are you guys? How are you defensively feeling his absence, if at all? Well, I think first of all, Coach kind of does that to be humble. Uh, he's involved in every facet of this program. Um, but I think defensively probably less than offensively because that's that's where his specialty is. I think the biggest thing you miss is his leadership, uh, the inspiration, the things he provides, not only the players but the coaches. And, uh, you know, I always felt my one of my biggest jobs as a head coach was to coach the coaches because then that is exponential. That can spread throughout the team. Uh, coach the coaches and really help the leaders lead, and that leaders meaning the players. Ryan was very complimentary to the assistance you've, you've given him. What do you feel like is the most valuable thing, the most valuable insight maybe that you've been able to provide him throughout this whole thing? Well, we've talked a lot, you know, and, and Ryan's only been here a year, and I've only been here going on my third year, so I didn't know Ryan before he came. Uh, we've gotten, I'd say in the last 30 days, a lot closer. Um, and that's been neat because he's a, he's a special guy. He's got a bright, bright future. Um, probably be himself. You know, he's, we have a program here. And, and as Ryan has told our staff and told our players, he's holding the spot until coach gets back. So we have a program. We have a philosophy. We have core values. We're sticking to the, to the plan. But within the plan, there's daily decisions that must be made. And I told Ryan, you know, Listen, hear me out, hear Kevin out. But at the end of the day, you have to do what you feel comfortable with because your name now is in front of that program. From the right, Tim. Uh, Tim May, Columbus Dispatch. Greg, uh, what is the biggest mistake you made in your first game as a head coach that still sticks with you? Do you remember? Oh, I remember yeah. it very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> We're at the University of Buffalo, which was a monster crowd, as you can imagine, right? Yeah. Rutgers, Buffalo. We had not won forever. And... Um, I'm so excited to go coach the game, and I'm going to lead the team onto the, onto the field. And I'm standing in the tunnel waiting for them to say, go ahead. And uh, I noticed that I don't have my call sheet or my game plan with me. So now an experienced head coach would call the assistant over and say, hey, do me a favor, go get the game plan in the, in the locker room. But not having that experience, what did I do? I worked my way through the crowd, through the players, got it, sprinted up, and just as I got back, we were able to take the field on time. But uh, that's what I remember. Thankfully, things calmed down a little, and we won that game. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's my, my recollection. Was there a sense, though, going into that, that there were going to be decisions you have to make like that as the head coach? I mean, during the game, I mean, how do you prepare for, for that as opposed to just worrying about the defense or the offense? You know, I think certain – Certain guys, from the minute they get into this thing, are preparing to be a head coach. And that's just the way they're wired. And I think other guys are really great assistant coaches, and maybe someday they become head coaches or maybe they don't. From the day I started coaching, I knew I wanted to be a head coach. And I worked for some tremendous, legendary head coaches, both in high school and in college and in the NFL. And um, I constantly was studying them. And, and my high school coach, Mike Miello, who started me in this profession. He told me, you're going to go on and you're going to work for several people. Don't only write down the good things, but write down the things you wouldn't do. So I took that advice very seriously and um, was preparing the whole time. As you've gotten ready for Oregon State, obviously Jonathan Smith's come from Washington, that whole that idea that they have plays, they don't have a scheme, you know, things like that. But I, I don't know, what's, is this an open book almost? Or if you studied a lot of Washington, a lot of Colorado, just how have you gotten ready 
defensively for this opener? Well, we studied both. You know, we we are we'd like to think that we have a system that can adapt within the game, and that's something that we're we constantly talk to our players about. Is we'll go in with a blueprint, but we're not married to anything because we have a menu. We can use certain things. If they change, we can change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I get a kick sometimes of the defensive coaches who say, you know, I don't care what they do, we dictate. And that's not true. They line up in a formation. We don't tell them how to line up. And then we have to react to that. So it starts with that, and uh, it obviously goes much deeper. But um, I think that uh, in games like this, new head coach, offensive head coach, has an offensive coordinator. So you really have to spend some double time studying both, but not marrying yourself to either. Because you may get a third, you may get a hybrid.